Welcome to Revolution Against Evolution. I'm your host, Doug Sharp. Your co-host, Rich Gear here as well. As a guest, we have Kirby Riles. Kirby, it's glad to, glad to have you here. He's got a, a new book coming out called Killer God, and we're going to talk all about that. I'm pretty excited about that. It's not a, it's not a thick tome. Nope. It's very readable, and um, I was actually I was reading a little bit of it before we got started here. So, I don't know, Doug, how do you want to start this show? Well, uh, we need to, uh, to talk a little bit about uh, the concept that uh, uh, is God a genocidal mass murderer, <laughs> so, such as what uh, uh, Richard Dawkins would accuse him of being, or, or a lot of atheists uh, stumble over this uh, thing where uh, you find in the scriptures where God executes uh, severe judgment on nations, on the on people and uh, even uh, to the point where uh, he had to go in and uh, uh, start off, start over with Noah. Uh, oh yeah. Because uh, he had to, uh, the sin had gotten so bad in the world. And uh, so uh, the assumptions, there's <coughs> several assumptions that you have, Kirby, that uh, uh, atheists uh, have that uh, uh, cause them to uh, be so-called non-believers. Yeah, yeah they, they stumble over some hidden assumptions. And uh, I'm hoping, that, and I, in fact, I'm sure there's some watching right now that are, can, would consider themselves atheists. And so I would politely ask you to be patient as we look at five assumptions. You, shall I go ahead and start with the first yeah, one? Yeah, why don't, why don't you do that, yeah. Okay, and uh, this is in the first chapter of the book. Uh, first assumption is that um, we assume there is no supernatural world, that there is nothing that we can't see. There's no no heaven. There's no hell. There's no God. So that's an assumption, and the problem is there's no proof that assumption is correct. In fact, the opposite is the case, and so it leads us into a false conclusion. So to do a mathematical formula without all the elements of, that you need to plug into the equ equation, all the X factors, you're, you're going to end with a bad result. And so to exclude or assume that there is no supernatural world is to begin from a non-scientific basis. Now, I would say it this way. If you were doing some research on what, on the result of two added to two, and you started from your research from the very beginning saying, I'll consider any answer except for four. That's not scientific. It's not logical. And so we come to this issue of, of God creating the world, of all the evidences we have for that, and we say we'll accept any conclusion, except anything that's supernatural. Yeah, who's the guy, Doug, that once said that we can, it's, it's, it's not the creation isn't a viable theory, but we cannot allow a supernatural foot in the door. Do you remember who that was that said that? That was a quote. I think it was Lee Wanton or something. something Lee, like yeah, something like that. Anyway, but it doesn't really matter who, but that was, that is what you're saying is exactly what it is. We yeah. cannot allow a supernatural foot in the door because they've, they've redefined science, number one, which literally just means knowledge as far as I know, but it means, but they, it, it's only naturalism. That's what they, they've... Yeah. So anything that's outside of what you can see or touch is not allowed to be considered. And yeah. that is kind of the opposite of, of the scientists of the past. From George Washington sure. Carver, Isaac Newton, we can list a lot of them, which doesn't necessarily mean that they're right either, but it's just that um, these people had no problem with the idea that there, was, that there could be realms outside of what you yeah. can see and touch. But today's modern science, <laughs> we don't allow that. So yes. that's your first uh, assumption. It is, and... Uh, it's, I've got some support for that, but I'd like to say in the defense of, of those watching who think, oh, how can you quantify the supernatural? Well, you can't. It's very difficult. And I understand that in a, a laboratory setting, you cannot say one plus one plus a miracle equals two. I mean, that's not very, <laughs> you can't quantify that. And I know that's difficult, but I would ask the viewers to be patient with us because we're going to provide some support for this. And the first thing I would say is, you know, uh, there is evidence for the supernatural world. First thing, and we know near-death experiences have been studied by secular and, uh, and, and other groups, they exist. And the science is indeed puzzled by these things. So there, we have like the curtain peeled back, we have a glimpse into the supernatural world right there. But let's step on to the fact that most atheists 
believe in the supernatural. Now that, that surprised me when you said yeah, that. And, and, and I was shocked myself. But I've talked to some atheist friends, and they said, "Yeah, yeah, we believe in it." And I've known plenty of people that say they're atheists, and they read their horoscopes, they read tarot cards, they believe in the, in seances. One of the most famous crystals. A, crystals <laughs> one of the most famous atheists in U.S. history is the lady who had prayer band, and her name was Madeline Murray O'Hare. Madeline yeah. Murray O'Hare, and her son, ironically, the son uh, that she sued to have prayer band in the school, yeah. ended up becoming a Christian. William Murray, and wrote a book called My Life Without God, and in it he quotes his mother, uh, where she uh, or he he refers to his mother where she went to seances regularly. Hmm. So this woman who was a staunch atheist believed in the supernatural. That seems illogical because it is illogical. And then we have another person who's highly critical of God, highly uh, made a, a love to mock Christianity. And you may not know this, especially late in his life, he was quite vicious about it. Mark Twain, Samuel Clemens, was really cruel and harsh with God. He accused God of of being a killer. Mm. And right in the first chapter of the book, uh, the first page, here's what uh, Mark Twain said about God. He says, um, uh, he is totally without mercy. I'm quoting. He who is called the fountain of mercy, he slays, slays, slays all the men, all the beasts, all the boys, all the babies, also all the women and all the girls. He makes no distinction between innocent and guilty. So uh, he was quite angry. But of anger, course, of course, angry from a Christian what? viewpoint, there is none righteous. True. All our all our righteousness is, is as filthy rags. There's a there's a disclaimer here mm-hmm. that before a holy and perfect God. That you say you don't believe in, uh, we are stained. Yeah, and that's that's the whole the whole premise. Uh, absolutely, we do as Christianity. But, but, but the real know. irony about Mark Twain is in his biography, written by his official biographer, his personal assistant, wrote a very good biography which you can download for free. Read it if you don't believe me. Go to uh, Project Gutenberg; it's there. Okay. And uh, but in that, he notes that his uh, when he was just a pilot. On the steamboat going to the Mississippi. Oh yeah, yeah. his uh, he had a dream, and in the dream he saw his beloved younger brother mm. lying in a coffin, dead, with a bouquet of white flowers and a red rose right in the center. And he woke up. It's a very vivid dream. It scared him. He told it to his sister, and he tried to put it out of his mind. But when he got to the boat, he was very careful because his brother was going to be on the boat with him. Now he got his brother a job on the steamboat, Pennsylvania down to New Orleans. And so he was just real worried about his brother and tried to make sure he was safe. Well, he got into an argument with the captain and was mm-hmm. put off the boat or quit, I don't know which, in New Orleans. And his brother sailed up back up the river on the steamboat, and the steamboat, as they were wont to do, exploded. Because it's very hard to control the steam pressures in those days. With uh, whatever the reasons, it exploded. His oh. brother was severely burned and injured and ended up dying. And when he got to Memphis, he found his brother in a metal coffin, just as he'd seen in the dream. Mm. Those were rare in those days, a metal coffin. And he had a bouquet of flowers. The ladies that were taking care of him had put there with a red rose right in the center, exactly like he'd seen in the dream. So, atheist who believes in the supernatural. Uh, And lastly about that, um, the UK-based Understanding Unbelief Project this is reported in the New Scientist magazine. Uh, re- referred to a project interviewing thousands of self-identified atheists and agnostics from six countries, and they found that a majority believe in at least one supernatural phenomenon. A majority, 71% of atheists believe in either reincarnation or life after death, and agnostics hold it at 92%. Well, you know, that just reminds me of the C.S. Lewis uh, thing, I think it was a mere Christianity where he wrote this. He said, "Oh no, screw tape letters," mm-hmm. where he that, that screw tape and was writing to, to Wormwood. Uh, you know, they were yes. back, and he says it's not that the master, that is the devil, wants people to not believe in anything. He wants to be worshipped himself, <laughs> and so many of these things they 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 get off the off the dime, so to speak. They get off the Christian thing, and now they're floundering. And inside of us, inherently, we know 
there's something outside of, of this flesh, mm -hmm. of this body. We know that the mind is is supranatural. If it's not supernatural, mm -hmm. it's something about that. Language is mystical. And when we take it for granted, because we use it every day, just like we're using now. But all these things indicate there's something beyond the mere physical. And that's why, but, but once you get off the revelation, it gives you the truth of stuff. Suddenly, the devil can get in there and then <coughs> then come me. Yes. You know, reminds me of that, what was that snake in Jungle Book? Trust in yes, me. Yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Now, this uh, scripture here, mm -hmm. I think, uh, helps us uh, understand mm -hmm. uh, what uh, the atheist is all about. It says, the Bible says, a natural person does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are folly to him, and he is not able to understand them because they are spiritually discerned. And, and so there's a um, mechanism that happens when you uh, make the decision to have Christ in your life. You mm -hmm. become uh, energized by the Spirit of God, and then it uh, transforms your understanding. Mm -hmm. But if you haven't gotten uh, to the point where you've um, asked uh, Jesus to rule your life, well, then... The, then you're naturally going to uh, think everything, everything about God is foolish. Right, because the assumption we have is the revelation of <coughs> Jesus Christ, His Word. That is the spiritual thing you need to know. Because these, I, what we've been sharing is they they're perfectly willing to accept spiritual things. Yes, they? yeah. But not the not the true God, not the mm -hmm. true Spirit. Which is uh, that's the premise that we have with what we're saying here. The true God gives you the right path to walk on, gives you purpose and meaning and understanding, but they're perfectly content to uh, to go into false spirit things. They yep. can understand that, but they the, but the true spirit suddenly that becomes that's folly to them. Yeah, it, it, it really is true. Uh, I lived for a number of years in in Belgium and in France, where there's a strong interest in the supernatural, oh, yeah. in the occult, and you'll see people advertising, uh, call Madame so and so for your uh, reading or your your tarot reading, whatever it would be. And the French are pretty atheist. They really are, most oh, yeah. of them. And uh, yet they can go to these mediums and the seers and the tarot card readers, and they can hold these mutually contradictory ideas in their head at the same time. So there is a supernatural world. Even the atheists admit it. So we're just simply saying hey, the supernatural world also includes the Bible, includes God. The second assumption uh, is that we don't trust God. And I think some people, they don't want to believe that God exists. The idea of God is scary to them. They don't have a right conception of God. They think he's some kind of a monster. They're afraid of him. Um, there's a passage where Jesus did, talked about the parable of the talents. And the third servant came and said, here's the money that you gave me, because I knew you were a harsh man. So and, I it. and I was afraid of you. So there's some people, they have a harsh, negative view of God, and so it's very hard for them to understand some of these issues, God's judgment or, or the earth, because of that. And some of that betrayal is because we, as human beings, are often as bound by our own fleshly understanding. Like, you know, that thing about things of God. It's really hard for us to understand things outside of what we can see or touch, feel, hear, those kinds of things. And that's what the Scripture challenges us. That's what Jesus is challenging us, what God the Father is challenging us to believe in something outside of ourself. And the thing is, when suddenly something goes wrong in the natural, okay, got a wife that betrays you, mm -hmm. got children that basically uh, reject God, you've got, you've got, suddenly you have somebody who you love gets killed or injured severely. All of those things, or could be anything as, as pedantic as uh, you know, losing a job or something, mm -hmm. which you didn't, there's all kinds of things. So we feel betrayed by God. Mm -hmm. I got to, I I can yeah. testify that firsthand, sure. and those feelings. Luckily, I was rooted and grounded for a long time before what happened to my wife happened. You know, because it was mm -hmm. it's hard, yeah. and and I think it's very difficult. And I don't cha and I challenge people, but I don't ask them to do it without asking God to help them to do that. Because trusting God, His ways, as they said, is above our ways, and sometimes those ways do not do not. They they challenge us in everything we are because mm -hmm. they are hard sometimes. They are not always. Oh, they lived happily ever after. Oh no, 
once the challenge is done, suddenly we just, mm -hmm. no, that does not happen in this life yeah. necessarily. So I think for those watching, if I, we'd like to challenge you to examine your motives. Are you afraid of God? Is, is the concept of God uh, something that's scary, uh, that he's mean and cruel? It's going to be very hard to work through that and find the truth when we have from the beginning a negative per perception there. So just one of those assumptions we come to. And the third one, because uh, this book's talking about God being a killer. Uh, killing people, and as, as Doug said, it's got a genocidal mass murderer. Uh, I put that in there because some people said, you've got to have the word genocidal in the title. Because that's what everybody's talking about, genocidal God. And others said, no, no, you've got to have mass murderer in the title. Everyone says God's a mass murderer. So I put them both in there, and we're going to hit all the buzzwords. So, uh, so the question is, can, is God violent? And if you say about a neighbor, well, he's violent, everybody says, oh, oh, that's not good. And so we immediately think violence is a bad thing. It's always bad. And yet when you ask the question, of course the answer is, no, it's not always bad. Policemen, like this guy who killed the, the shooter there um, just the other day, he shot him within four minutes. He'd already killed eight people. Wow! The policeman was, was there, happened to be there, there in, in Dallas and in Allen, Texas, and the policeman shot him. And the guy had body armor on. How he could shoot oh, him? Oh my God! And he had a pistol. The guy had an AR-15. It was absolutely a miracle and courageous of this policeman. But the point, nonetheless, is this policeman was violent. Are we going to fire him? You were violent, and violence is always bad. Oh no, it isn't always bad. He saved people's lives. God is has the right to be violent like a policeman has the right to be violent, like a soldier has the right to be violent. Notice this verse in Romans 11.22. Um, uh, God, it says this, Behold in the kindness and severity of God mm -hmm. to those who fell severity, but to you God's kindness, if you continue in his kindness. So God is, is indeed kind, but he's also severe. Well, you know, I think about that, and maybe you get this with another one of your points, but the, some of the judgments the Lord gave, God and gave to the Israelites in the Old Testament, for instance, mm -hmm. when he told them to slay, slay, slay the men, children, animals, everything, and you're going, wow, don't take anything. You know, that mm -hmm. seems really, wow, that's hard. Yeah. And they go, how can you kill the children, the innocent children? I, the scripture understanding is none of us are innocent. Mm -hmm. <laughs> none of us are innocent. Right. And I'm thinking... My own particular opinion is, and I have no way to prove this, I'm not dogmatic about it at all, what if killing them was a mercy before they degenerated into terrible sin and corruption, right. uh, and, yet, and they could have eternal life? See, this life is not all there is. Again, I predicate things. If we judge only with the flesh, we are in trouble. Because this flesh does not work very good. Christians do not necessarily live happily ever after lives. Mm -hmm. Read, read all the thing about the, the early church, man, the martyrdoms, and, and what's going on even today, sometimes even worse. And people are, are dying, and, and dying is not the end of the story. Yeah. It's the beginning. So I think about that in sense, uh, the people that are already corrupted, it prevented them, their corruption from spreading, perhaps, but also maybe perhaps began to yeah. spread to their children. I don't know. I'm just saying, I'm just throwing that out there that there are things we don't have. I think you said in the very beginning. When you don't have all the X factors, all the all the criteria all the that makes a mercy, we're we're judging from incomplete information. Incomplete information. And we're trying, and not to say we don't have some information, and we can speculate and postulate, but we don't know for sure. But my my experience with the God who has come into my life is He is merciful. Yeah. He is just. He is kind. But things don't always go out. The, it doesn't mean I'm, everything in this life is going to be perfect. It doesn't mean we're going to ever yeah. understand everything no. about it. No. And I, I like what you said. We have incomplete information, and so we are in a very risky place to judge God. Uh, I want to note one thing. Um, wasn't about three years ago, uh, a creationist offered to debate Richard Dawkins on the idea of violence, God's violence in the Bible. Oh yeah. And it, it was he even wrote a letter to the I think the, the Times in England. Saying I'm ready to debate Richard Dawkins, and Richard Dawkins got tired of being uh, goaded on that. And specifically, he was going to touch on the issue of violence in the Bible. And uh, so, Richard Dawkins wrote an article that was published in the paper, and he said, "I would never debate on this topic for it's outrageous the idea that God could kill people, and that there could be a justification for it." Now, he pushed what I call the outrage button. 
And when you push the outrage button, all conversation ceases. All <laughs> rational discourse, all evidence, all logic is gone because you push the outrage button. That you're not even going to talk to it. You put your fingers in your ears and go, la, 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 I can't hear you. <laughs> That's what Richard Dawkins did. There's no discussion of it. This book goes into these things in detail. As long as no one pulls the outrage, but pushes the outrage button, then they can discover that there are rationales, there are explanations for these things, but they're not simple. Uh, they have to be explained. And I think part of the reason why it's complicated, and I mentioned this in the next to the last chapter, is that I think this is a test. God has presented this to us. Those who are looking for an excuse to reject God will find it here. You, if you're looking for a reason to say, I reject God, you will find it here. If you're looking for the truth, you'll find that also. It's like when Jesus asked his disciples, when there was a hard thing, will you leave me also? I, I, are you bereft of your own virtue enough to realize you are utterly dependent upon a sovereign God for mercy, grace, and love? And yeah. when that happens, you say, I, where, where am I going to go? Yeah. Where can I go? You have the words of life. And I don't, I, you know, I want to live. You know, that's, that's the thing about that. I still remember the time when I, put, when I read that thing about uh, when John the Baptist sent the people to, the, uh, to, uh, to uh, Jesus and, and said, uh, you know, he's in jail. And he says, are you the one we're supposed to look for? Or should we look for another? Yeah. And Jesus said, hey, the dead are raised, the lame walk, you know, the deaf hear, and the gospel of the kingdom is preached. And then he goes... But blessed are those who are not offended for my name's sake. It's almost like he's saying, John, I am not going to rescue you. Mm -hmm. John got his head chopped off. But that's not the end of the story for the, right. for the believer. And Jesus knows that. Of course, he came his own self to be, in, be the intercessor for all of us yeah. by dying himself. He took all it took all on there. But the whole idea, are you going to be, a, don't, blessed are those who are not offended. Really? That's, it's a challenge things. for us. And are it's we, hard. Are we, we can really choose is. to be offended here. The other day, a friend of mine is a pacifist, and he was arguing with the idea that Christians should defend themselves or serve in the military. And uh, I said, well, what about when Jesus made a whip? And he went in and he hit people with that whip, and he overturned tables, and it's mentioned in all four of the Gospels. Well, he said, well, he made a whip, but I don't think he hit anybody with it, which just, I think it's pretty silly. I mean, what, what's it for? You know, what's a whip oh, for? Man. There's a lot of things people they got they got theory and it doesn't always work. It's, you know, oh. Like the one, like the people said, no, Jesus, Jesus, that 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 wasn't really wine he turned it into. It was grape juice. Yes. Oh, really? That's why they call him a drunkard and a glutton because he because he turned it into grape juice. I'm sorry, you know, there's just things don't work. You know. Yeah. So the thing with Jesus was violent, and he we don't see a contradiction between the Old Testament violent God and the kind. There's violence in both. And there's kindness and mercy in both. You have to read the Bible completely, otherwise you're going to distort a view. Because it, it's there in both both Old and New Testaments. Um, so then, Doug, shall we go into the fourth of uh, Yeah, assumption? no, let's uh, we, talk about uh, examples of people who are looking for an excuse. Okay. Uh, I, I had uh, a case of that in uh, Lviv. I was in Ukraine uh, about a year ago. And we were out at the train station handing out tracks, talking to people about the Lord. And a guy came by, he was from Spain, we spoke English, and he got to talking to us. And, and he said, said, oh yeah, I'm, I'm studying the violence in the Bible. I said, well, that's very interesting because I've written a book, I'm writing a book on it. It wasn't finished at the time. And I'd be glad to ask, answer any questions yeah. you might have if, if I'm able to. Yeah. And the, uh, he said, no, I don't, I don't want to talk about it. Wait, 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 wait. <laughs> and I said, well, are you reading the New Testament? No, 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 only the Old Testament, only the passages about violence. And I said, well, I'll give you my email address. You can write me later because, you know, we're just seeing your brief. He didn't want that. And finally, I realized he was studying these cases to find ammunition, not to get understanding, but to get some excuse so he could reject God. I, have you met someone like that, Doug? Yeah, I, uh, well, uh, it's an old story about uh, W.C. Fields. He was reading the Bible. And somebody says, oh, oh you're <laughs> reading the Bible. He, he says, oh, yes, I'm looking for a loophole. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds like W.C. Fields, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but, uh, you know, that, that's, uh, you know, people really are not uh, interested in getting their questions answered if they're uh, really hell-bent on uh, 
uh, being hell bent. Being hell bent. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. Well, um, there's more we could discuss here. I know we have a little bit, of, not much time left. But um, so, if we're looking for an excuse to reject God, uh, it's going to be very hard to find the truth about these things. So, the fifth thing is, we don't believe God has the right to judge us. So that uh, that He has the right to judge the world. And I see so many people, especially Richard Dawkins, who like to view God as if He was a man, and they judge Him as if He was a man. Who does He think He is? And so, I've said this before, but it's such a good illustration. It's like a child telling their parent, who do you think you are? Telling me when to get up and I have to go to school and eat vegetables. Who do you think you are? <laughs> and and uh, you know, God is God. He's not a man. And we cannot judge him as if he was a man. He is God. There is a double standard. And we say that double standards are evil. Well, they're not always. Children and parents have double standards. They really do have that. So we cannot reach the right conclusion if we treat God as if he was just a, a man. So uh, my, I, I was told this story many times. When my wife took my son, Luke, to have his vaccination, he's about two years old. The doctor said, please hold your son down while I give him the shot. So she mm -hmm. did. He got the shot. As soon as that was done, my wife let him up. And he sat up, looked at her angrily, and whack, he hit her. Wow. And, uh, so How old was he at the time? Two. He was two what? years old. So in his mind, his mother, he had judged as a judge. He had appointed himself as a judge of his mother. And he had convicted her of accessory to child abuse. And then he sentenced her to be punished by being hit. And thirdly, he carried out the punishment himself. He was judge, jury, and executioner <laughs> and whacked his mother. And we're the same way. You know, we judge God. We are mad at him. We say, who do you think you are creating the world? We don't like the, you. We don't want you to be our king. It's, it's a wrong way of looking at things. And Doug, I don't think we're going to get to the other proofs. but No, I think that uh, we're getting close on time. But I think uh, to... Uh, uh, if you read uh, Kirby Ryle's book, Great Color God, and uh, this will uh, actually give uh, take this uh, tough question head on. Uh, it's something that uh, really needs to be addressed by both Christians and and for those who are uh, mad at God. Uh, I don't call the people who are mad at God atheists because they uh, they believe in the God. <laughs> yeah, you know, yeah. they're mad at him. And, Doug, can I say that it's not out yet? It's in pre-publication state. It's going to be out with Abundance Books. Okay. And so, uh, and how do you get a hold of it when they're? Uh, it'll just go to abundance-books.com, and it's, it'll be up in about a week or maybe a uh, month. That's online. Is that yes? Okay. All right. <clears throat> well, I uh, appreciate you being on our uh, show, uh, Kirby, and uh, we'll, we hope that you um, you pursue this question yourself uh, dig into the scriptures uh, read your bible and uh, ask god to reveal himself to you uh, and, and he's not a killjoy uh, he is one who brings uh, perfect peace and uh, and uh, happiness and the eternal life so in that uh, vein i uh, hope you join us next time on revolution against evolution yep.